Welcome to the International Printing Museum. Uh, this is probably your first experience at a printing museum. This is actually one of the largest collections of antique printing presses just about anywhere. Unfortunately, here at the museum, we can't show you all of it because we don't have enough space. What's not inside of our galleries here, uh, we still have uh, at least two other warehouse buildings and yeah, up, almost up to 20 semi-containers filled up with the machines. This is mostly one man's private collection, a guy in Los Angeles by the name of Ernie Lindner. And Ernie spent the majority of his life finding these machines around the world, around the country and around the world. And Ernie was kind of a big German fellow with rosy cheeks and a handlebar mustache. Live life to the fullest. He was 79 years young when he passed away in 2001, which we would consider young given the fact that at age 70, Ernie took an expedition to the North Pole for vacation. The year after that, he went to Russia, co-piloted a Russian MiG jet Mach 2 upside down over Moscow. And the year after that, if you've been to the North Pole, of course, you want to go to the South Pole. We actually have a picture here of Ernie on the South Pole. which was the middle of summer and it was still 30 degrees below zero. We have a picture of him on the North Pole as well. The entertaining part of the picture is that there is actually a pole there that you get to stand next to and all that. So Ernie, again, spent most of his life looking for machines. He was an equipment dealer here in Los Angeles and his father and his uncle before him as well, mostly in the world of linotypes, which we'll see on the tour. And all. Well, let's get started on a tour and show you the collection. All right. Well, I'm here inside Ben Franklin's Colonial Printing Shop here at the International Printing Museum. This is what Benjamin Franklin would have spent most of his life working with as a printer. Because of course, nobody really thinks of Ben Franklin as a printer. When you think of the name Ben Franklin, you probably think of what? Well, usually you usually come up with, uh, he was a great scientist with electricity and the kite and the key, uh, a great inventor, uh, one of our founding fathers, working on the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. Uh, all those other things, yet he wanted us to remember him first and foremost as a printer. And you know that, actually, if you read his will. And uh, in his will, where he lists who he was and, and what he's famous for and who gets all the stuff, he says, I, Dr. Benjamin Franklin, comma, printer. And then after that, he puts, oh, by the way, I was the president of Pennsylvania, the ambassador of France, I signed the Constitution, signed the Declaration of Independence, I was a great inventor, I played electricity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the first thing on that list is printing, and here's why. Ben Franklin actually learned to be a printer when he was a young boy at the age of 12, when his father apprenticed him to his older brother, James. He was actually the printer in the family. Uh, James was 21 at the time, had just come home from England, learned to be a printer there, came home to his family in Boston, and his father uh, uh, basically gave him his younger brother as, his, as a, an indentured servant, uh, and he began to learn the printing trade from his brother. He ended up leaving his brother uh, and then going from Boston, ended up in Philadelphia, started his first printing shop there at the age of 22, ran the business so well by the age of 42, Ben Franklin had dozens of printing shops all across the colonies. Uh, and those were of course making him a lot of money. He retired rich and wealthy at the age of 42 as one of our first millionaires. So now the kind of things that he printed inside a shop, of course, books. Here is a typical colonial book. This book is from 1753. Looks like our books today, just a little small. All hand set, I'm gonna be showing you in a moment here, I'll actually put the book together, but basically you take the letters out of the cases, assemble them together, put it inside the printing press, and then stamp it, press it onto paper. And, and Franklin, now in all that he did, uh, he did a lot of things in life, but he did not, though, invent printing. Printing was actually invented by the same people, the same uh, country that gave us pasta. Which would be who? No, it's not the Italians. The Chinese. And usually whenever you're in doubt in history, it's probably going to be the Chinese who invented it first. Um, what they did for printing was this. This is around the, the seventh or eighth century. They took a block of wood, then they would carve it out backwards in Chinese. That's hard enough to carve forwards in Chinese. They actually carved it backwards. So you whittle out the block backwards, rub some ink onto it with a rag, put a piece of paper on top, and then you rub or press on the back of the paper, and it puts the image on there. So when you peel it off, you could read it, if you could read Chinese. Great way to make a lot of copies. It takes you a while to carve the block, but once the block is carved, how many copies can you make? The average for the Chinese a thousand years ago, once they had the blocks, 
2,000, maybe up to 5,000 copies of the book. Now all of a sudden you have 5,000 books. You send the books out, people read it, get smart, come up with new ideas, new inventions, they make more books. This is how you build a civilization. You put your knowledge into book form so the people you will never meet will be able to gain from your knowledge and build upon it. The rest of the world knew how to make one book at a time. The Chinese, 5,000 at a time. Oh, and when you think about it, by the way, uh, who invented paper? No, not the Egyptians, the Chinese. And they did that about 2,000 years ago. So, so that's over in China. Over in Europe, uh, where Marco Polo came from, who discovered the pasta out there in China. Uh, if you go back a thousand years ago, if, if you want a book, somebody had to write the book out by hand. And the people who write the books, so if a king wanted a book, somebody's going to write it for him. The people who write the books were known as scribes. Uh, scribes are usually uh, monks at the monastery. And the monk, the scribe, first thing they have to do is make, it, make their writing tool, their, their pen. You don't buy them at a store, of course, you make it yourself. So they take the wing feather of a goose or a crow, and then you turn it into a pen called the quill. So they take a knife, they scrape it and sharpen it up, up to a point. And the most important part, actually, to get the quill to work, you have to cut a crack with a knife. You've got to cut a slit or a crack right down the center to the tip. And that crack is called the capillary. It's going to pull the ink down to the tip so you can write a fine line. If you don't have a capillary, the ink just blobs out. That's how your ballpoint pens work today, how trees have capillaries, our blood vessels are capillaries to move fluid. So the scribe would dip it in some liquid black ink, you write a couple letters, but you run out of ink. So you dip it in ink, write a couple letters, dip it in ink, write a couple letters. Something the size of a Bible takes a scribe, you know, three to five years to finish. At the end of five years of writing, how many books do you now have? One. And guess how much that book cost? A little bit of money. In our money today, you're looking at spending anywhere from $50,000 to $100,000 for a book. So if you can picture going down to like a bookstore, Barnes & Noble, with a wheelbarrow full of $100,000, you go into the store, you demand a book, and the lady behind the counter has got a big smile on her face, takes all your money and says, that'll be five years. I'll let you know when the book's finished. And we're keeping your money. Who could afford the books if it cost that much money? Obviously, the rich and the wealthy, so they, they, they can afford that. Uh, the kings and the queens, because they run the government. And then the third group, for the most part, would be those that are running the churches. And those would be the popes and the bishops. Sometimes your local church might only be able to afford one book, a Bible, chained up to the front on the altar so you didn't steal it on Sunday morning, which would defeat the purpose of being there on Sunday morning. Uh, so that's it. 5% of society, 5 people out of 100 had access to those books in this period of time that we would colloquially call the, the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. And not for a lack of light, it was just a lack of books and a lack of interest in those books. And then you begin to have something happen. Two, two events start to happen. One is the Renaissance and the other is the Reformation. And so there's a demand for books that's coming up. And on the scene in Germany comes a guy by the name of Johann or John Gutenberg. And Gutenberg in 1450 figured out a way to write books faster. He invented a machine to help him do that. We call this machine the printing press. But Gutenberg was German, so he called it my faster writing machine. Leave it to a German to name a machine, and that's how they name the machine. The word in German is my Schnellskribbenfabrik. One long word, no spaces. Here's how his faster writing machine worked. Gutenberg figured out a way to make these metal letters. He made hundreds and hundreds of copies of each letter of the alphabet. Here, for example, is a backwards capital O. Trust me. <laughs> now it's upside down or backwards. How he made these letters is fascinating. Gutenberg is a jeweler or a goldsmith by training. Uh, so he knew how to work with metal and rings and things like that. In fact, he's, his family has positions, has jobs at the local mint where they're making the coins. They're stamping the metal and making the shape of coins. So Gutenberg is watching this process and realizing he needs a lot of letters for the book. A lot of O's, a lot of A's, a lot of B's. But you don't want to sit there and carve a thousand O's out. It would take you forever. You want to shape the letter once and then make copies of that shape. Here's how he does it. He takes a blank piece of steel that's unhardened, soft steel. Doesn't mean you can bend it, but you can take a 
metal file like you find in your garage, you start filing the end of it, after the end of a day or two of work, if you did your job right, you would have filed a letter on there. And if you don't think that's hard, sit in your garage for a couple days with a piece of steel and a metal file and see what letter you can make. A hyphen is real easy. Now that your letter has been shaped, we have to harden the steel. This is a process known as tempering. You've seen it with blacksmiths. Uh, when you grab it with some tongs, put it into a hot flame until it's glowing red, then you quickly dunk it into a bucket of cold water. The change from hot to cold tempers, it changes the metal, hardens it. Or there'd be a loud popping sound and it might crack in half, which would be really exciting having just spent the entire day shaping one letter. Now that you have a hardened letter here, we take a piece of softer metal, such as copper, place this on top, take a hammer and we strike down on top of it. You punch it. This is actually called the punch. You stamp the punch into the softer metal and you form what's known as the matrix. And the matrix is the master from which you make the copies. You think of it like a cookie mold or a jello mold in the kitchen. So if we're not gonna pour liquid jello into this or cookie dough, we're gonna pour liquid metal, not ink, but liquid metal to form a letter. The punch now goes into a safe place. We're now going to be using the matrix. And this is where Gutenberg's genius is found when he invented this tool. This is the amazing tool that changes the world. I mean, the printing press gets all the credit because it's big and you can see it. But the printing press really is a modified machine that already existed. It's a modified wine press or an olive oil press. Gutenberg changed it a bit to have it function for what he needed to do for printing, but that machine basically existed, a giant screw that you uh, turn and create pressure. But when he invented this tool, the world changed. And the two halves of this tool come together and they interlock. And when they interlock, it forms a mold. You have a rectangular cavity on the inside there. We're gonna take our matrix, place it face down on top of the cavity, slide the two sides together, and this right here is actually a spring. So we move the spring over on top and it holds all three pieces together. I turn it over on the other side, you can see the other end of the cavity. It looks like a giant tooth. <laughs> Think of your cavity in your, in, your, in your own mouth or in your teeth. This one almost looks like it has fangs on it. So we're gonna use the hole in this end to, to fill up the cavity with metal. The next thing Gutenberg had to figure out was, well, what kind of a metal do I use? You have to make thousands and thousands of these letters do you want to use an expensive metal or a cheap metal? Probably as cheap as you can get away with. You need a metal that has a certain amount of hardness because we're going to be putting pressure on it over and over again so the softer metals won't work as well. But you probably also, do you want a metal that melts at a high temperature or melts at a low temperature? You probably want it to melt at the low temperature because then if it melts faster, you can save money, you can turn your fuel off. Gutenberg experimented with all sorts of metals. Nothing quite worked. This is a long process. I mean, we don't know exactly how much time, but he probably took anywhere from five to 10 years perfecting this process. So he comes up with a no one metal by itself worked for Gutenberg. So then he had a great idea. He decided to mix metals together, form what we call an alloy. So the alloy that Gutenberg worked with had three metals. First one, lead which is soft, but it's also really cheap. Second metal, tin. And the third metal, antimony. <laughs> Most people haven't heard of the word antimony, but it's the next metal after tin on the periodic table of elements, number 50 and 51. When you put those metals together, they actually melt at the low temperature of 550 degrees. And that's your oven on high broil. I mean, it doesn't melt the oven. The oven's made out of steel. To give you a difference, steel turns liquid at 2,500 degrees. And a wood fire only reaches 1,100 degrees. So you cannot use wood to melt steel. You can use wood to melt our lead alloy here, our metal alloy. Okay. So let's take a look now at the actual casting of it. So here's my metal melting away. Lead, tin, and antimony. Temperature, 550 degrees. Trust me, that's hot. So 
So it solidifies quickly. And it melts quickly. So let's go ahead and make a letter now. Let that metal get back in. I'm going to grab my mold. Pour our metal into the cavity, it fills it up, it solidifies quickly. A good typecaster can make two or three letters a minute. I mean, it takes you all day to make the master matrix, but once you have that, you can start casting, you know, literally a hundred letters, 100 to 150 letters an hour. So once they're made, you can use them over and over again in the printing press. Let's open it up, take the matrix out. We can see the letter inside the cavity. So the matrix forms the shape of the letter there for you perfectly. So if you make a thousand M's, they're all exactly the same. If you carved them, you would have them, but they all be different. They all be uniquely made. The mold actually controls the rectangular shape. That way all the letters fit with each other in rows like soldiers and they're all exactly the same height. And the height's important because all your letters are going to be put under pressure at one time. If one letter is just a little bit too short, it won't print. Gutenberg's accuracy in the height of the letters was within one hundredths of an inch. One thin slice out of the inch. And by the way, making the letters here, the last step here is that you have the triangular piece. That's known as a jet. And we have to break that off. So they would take a hammer and whack it off. What you end up then is a rectangular piece that you use in the printing press over and over again. That's Gutenberg's invention. But it's the perfection of making movable metal letters. And this one here, once we make it, we can use it over and over again. This one's already 50 or 60 years old. I can still work with this letter and put it into the printing press. Gutenberg's tool, by the way, remained unchanged making these letters for over 400 years. 1850, they're still using Gutenberg's basic principles and concept and his tools to make the letters that are used in the presses that change the world. After the letters have all been made, we're going to place them inside the cases here. If you do your printing, you would stand in front of the case, take your letters out, then you begin to assemble a page together one letter at a time. We use a holder to hold a small portion of the lines. And we're going to assemble it together one letter at a time, letter by letter, word by word, line by line, paragraph by paragraph. You get all of your letters together, take them over to a printing press, put ink on it, use a machine, then we're going to press it into paper. When you get done, you take the ink off, put the letters away, do it again for the next page. Doesn't that sound fast? Probably not, but it's faster than using the quill, the feather, pen, to write your book out. In fact, in five years, when a scribe with his quill could finish writing one book, one Bible, Gutenberg, in the same five years with his newer machine and his letters, he finished printing 180 Bibles. So was that a faster writing machine? I think so, very much so. So in doing your printing in your, in your typesetting, and this is the same in, in Ben Franklin's day. One of these cases here represents one font of type. So in my font of type, and we see that word on the computer. A font is one size, one style that for us fits into one of these cases. You can notice the capacity of my hard drive. I get 12 fonts here. My lowercase letters are on this side of the case. The more common letters in the center with the biggest boxes. Some of the popular letters of the alphabet are T, H, E, most popular, A, R, I, S. How about Z's, X's, and K's? We don't use all of those, so you get the little box on the outer edge. This way you can pick up the letters fast and put them away fast. Think of our, this is also a study in our language. Think of words like the, them, their, these, three, T, H, E. So you can pick them up fast and put them away fast. A and R is very common. I and S is very common. 
Then your capitals are actually alphabetical over here, beginning with the letter A. But this arrangement actually is kind of new. As printers, we've only been doing this way uh, since you know, about the 1840s. It used to be back when Ben Franklin was a printer of this guy, Gutenberg. They always put their letters in two places. The small letters you use the most, so they put them down here closer to you, and then they put their capitals in the second case up above them, what became known as uppercase letters and lowercase letters. That's a printer's word term that you're using. All right, we'll put some type here together. So I'm going to get my letters together and standing in front of the case, you're taking them out one letter at a time. And of course, these are the big letters to look at and read. Now that does not say to hello visitor or visitor hello to, but hello to the visitor. But these are headline size letters. Let, let me show you how small we can go. Good luck even seeing this one. This is what we call six point type. The fine print right there on the end. Lawyers love this stuff. We have some that's half that size. Three and a half point type. That can be very confusing if you're looking at it upside down and backwards all day long. So we get all of our letters together, we take them over to a printing press, put ink on it, use a machine, then we press it into paper. We do the same things with rubber stamps. If you ever seen a rubber stamp, it's, it's a printing device, it's backwards. You stamp on ink pad, then you stamp it on paper so you can read it. We do the same things at these amount of metal, and we have the machine, of course, to do the printing, but since I have this here in my hand, I will stamp this in my hand here for you. Using some pressure. Let's see what we get on that. Of course, we usually like to use paper rather than human vellum. Okay, when you get done with your printing, you take the ink off all the letters, what would you do with the letters at the end of the day? Of course, you gotta put everything away, so you'll run out of letters. Printers are like the rest of us. We all love to take things out. Not many of us like to put things away. But that's how you made all your books, all your newspapers, from the days of Gutenberg, 1450, through the days of Ben Franklin, 1750. Everything like this book here was all put together one letter at a time. This is not even a really big book, but that's a lot of letters to keep putting together. This was great in, Gut in Gutenberg's day, because your other choice is a feather. Ben Franklin's doing everything the same way. He's 350 years later. On the book right here, here's something else I think is kind of fun to look at on this one. So this book was printed on paper that was made by hand before we were a country. Listen. That paper is over 250 years old. Try and do that with a five-year-old newspaper. Probably fall apart on you. That's because that paper has no acid in it. It still remains strong. All right, well, let's take a step over to the Gutenberg Press. We'll watch the operations on there.